Before we begin, I wanted to give a huge shout out to the folks at Amazon Music for partnering with us on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. But more on this later. Right then, let's get right into today's episode. And so, after years and years of hype, the Las Vegas GP is finally over. Does it feel flat at the very end of it? Does it live up to all the hype that we've built up over the last few months and days as well? That we should discuss on the Inside Line F1 podcast, among many other things as well. We should talk about the grandstand gate, the manhole covers, the stewards, about so many things like the surface as well. And also, is a five second penalty for Max enough or was it more of a gift? What do you think, Sokunal? Five seconds for Max. I mean, yes, he accepted it, but in a way, if you come to think about it, he actually benefited from that penalty. If he was forced to drop down, maybe Ferrari could have had a win. If we had a manhole cover not really blowing up, maybe Carlos Sainz could have been winning. Who knows? And maybe if the fans were allowed to stay in the grandstands on the Thursday, they wouldn't have had a class action suit towards themselves, (laughs) the Las Vegas Grand Prix. I mean, we all saw it coming at some point of time, saying if you mess up a service in America, there's a good chance somebody could sue you. In this case, there are lots of somebodies who are suing Formula One. But should we really open with the suing part? Should we really open with the penalty part? Or should we just really get to how good or how bloody damn good this race was? And why we really think you know, giving insights, of course, why we really think that this was a damn good race. I mean, when was the last time, gentlemen, that we had the top three in the battle for the win on merit? We literally had no clue who's going to finish first, second or third. But I must admit, when I saw Max closing in on Checo and Charles, I said, I know he's finishing first. I didn't know the position of the other two drivers. It's like the Jaws background music working on, right? You can see Max coming in and dun, 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 dun. You know, it's the end coming through. But funnily enough, Sundaram, after Singapore, this is the first time that we've had a gap that close. And at last, yes, we've had all the chaos in the background. Yes, we have a, a smiley on the Las Vegas sphere and a Google Chrome logo and Fernando Alonso's face and so many other things on there. But at the end, I think it's fair to say it was a good race, right? In a way. If you're talking specifically about the race, I think it was a brilliant race. I think there's no other way of looking at it. I think the general hype was around the whole event in in, in, in entirety. Sure, there were things that could have been better. Sure, that there were things that should have been taken care of beforehand itself. Um, considering the sort of hype, considering the sort of price that people are paying for the event. But generally, if we look at the race in isolation. I think that was a bloody good race. It had everything. It, it wasn't the case where one battle dictated uh, how the race went in general. But I think there was a lot happening up and down the whole grid. Safety cars, collisions, uh, difference in strategies as well. So in general, I'm very, very happy with what I saw in today's race. Let's see how next year's race goes. And thankfully, we got the moment of the entire season. At the end of the year, we do the Inside Line F1 Podcast Awards, where we review all the bullshit moments that we tend to see, right? All the rubbish that normally people would miss that we keep an eye on. And one of those things was Bruce Buffer screaming Sergio Perez's name right on his face. And Sergio just didn't know how to react. He was just kind of confused, like, am I meant to be shouting? Am I meant to be puffing my chest? It's, it's funny how... It's, it's funny how the American treatment feels so awkward to all the Formula 1 drivers. But let's get to that in a second. Firstly, let's tell you who we are and what this is. Yes, this is the Carlos Sainz Fan Club podcast. It's also the Carlos Sainz Heartbreak Consoling Club podcast as well. But more formally, we're known as the Inside Line F1 podcast. My name is Somal Arora. I am the host of the Indian Racing League and also the voice of the MotoGP Indian Grand Prix. Joining me as always, F1 Stats Guru, our friend Sundaram Ramaswamy, who is a part of the WTF1 content creator pool and also the official statistician for the Indian Racing League, among many other championships, including, hopefully soon, the F1 Academy Series as well. And of course, uh, Kunal Shah, the former marketing head of the Sahara Force India Formula 1 team, which, by the way, is a very interesting point because we're going to have a special connection episode to that coming out soon on the podcast. Stay tuned, folks. But also, he's currently an FIA-accredited F1 journalist working for the Viaplay Network in Norway. 
Now then, Saturday night race, one o'clock local time. There's chaos all along. Guys, do we want to talk about the serious stuff first or the banter? Because in a way, what we saw on track was fantastic. But there are also times in cases like the grandstand issues, like the manhole covers, like the max penalty or the surface that really, I think, put to highlight why this was such a hollow event in a way. It's, it's kind of like all American sports, that the hype is so great, but it, they lack in their fundamentals. And the, fundament, and the fundamentals, right, just basic stewarding, I think that was a bit off. What do you guys think of the Carlos Sainz penalty, firstly? Because in my opinion, had he not got that penalty, genuinely, I think it wouldn't have been Max winning the race. I mean, look at the pace. He went back down to the back of the grid, came back up to P7, even though he had a disaster and got impeded by the safety car. I just get a feeling, Kunal, that we got lost. I mean, we, we, we lost out on an even better battle than we got. Well, yeah, we lost out on a battle, most definitely. But I see what you've done here, Samuel. You very nicely weaved us all as the Carlos Sainz fan club members. Are we right? not? Well, you know, I'm I'm actually a fan of maybe 18 out of the 19, 18 out of the 20 drivers on the grid. And probably if you're an avid listener of our podcast or follow us on social media, you know the two drivers I'm not a fan of, right? So very clearly putting myself out there. There are two drivers who I'm not a fan of. A quick hint, North American drivers, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, wait, there wait, we wait. go. But For, So according to Helmut Marco, that does not include Sergio Perez, Right. Yeah, you could say, I mean, yeah, so that's true. Yeah, <laughs> depending on how he sees his map uh, or his globe uh, positioning. But no, on, on, a, on a very serious note, the, the Carlos Sainz penalty is a bit of a bummer, right? Because when something like this happens, the stewards actually said, we don't want to penalize him, but we can't do that. And that's why we have to still penalize him. To me, the bigger challenge here was not just the, the grid penalty, which saw today's entertainment be impacted and i say entertainment because imagine we had three uh cars from two different teams battling could have been four cars from two different teams battling strategy against the other one holding up the other we've seen carlos Sainz's defensive driving in the last few races as well we know how good he can be trying to keep some of them ba- some drivers back and i get this feeling when he's battling when he's defending against max he's a little more aggressive in his defense carlos Sainz. but anyway leaving that aside the the grid penalty aside it's also the impact ferrari would have or now actually has had on the budget cap mm. because all these components he's changed were very expensive and i i mean the best way to summarize this is that carlos Sainz finished ahead of both the mercedes cars and it was uh, christian nimowal from motorsport.com uh, i think it was motorsport or motorsporttotal.com i can't remember was the one who sort of said that it was mercedes and toto wolf specifically who vetoed against giving Carlos Sainz a free change of components because obviously Ferrari and Mercedes are battling for P2 in the Constructors' Championship. I mean, come on, Sundaram. I mean, if it was Toto's car that got hit up by this, surely he would be complaining as well, right? The only thing I've learned from looking at all the last couple of years and all the media interviews that Christian and Toto do is to never trust what a team principal says when they're on a job because they're just so, I mean... Sure, they have to do what they have to do for their team. But come on, you can't be that uh, lacking in principle, if that's the right word. For for someone who's a team principal, actually, in a way, I think that, that, that makes it even funnier. I think that's been the general theme this weekend in, in general. I've, I've seen a lot of cases where a lot of people have just been pro the event and pro the regulations or pro the decisions. Uh, but Toto Wolf's outburst, especially in the press conference or generally in actions, were a little questionable in, in my opinion, because the one thing that I really don't get after free practice one, why do we still have drain cover issues? And and the fact that Toto Wolf mentioned it, we've had it before, it's nothing. Two things are, are really of, of, of concern for me. Firstly is the safety of the drivers, because if manhole covers can't be drilled down or they can't be welded into place properly. Um, does that really guarantee the safety of the drivers or the participants yeah. involved? We, we, I, we remember seeing Roman Grosjean having a very, I, I, would, I would still call it a nasty crash in, in Malaysia 2017. So my question is, why do we still have issues with manhole covers? Sure, we're racing around street circuits and probably every single drain cover is, is different from from the other. 
but probably these things could have been taken care of beforehand. And then secondly, then comes the lengthy delays with with uh, the audience being literally kicked out, a uh, five hour delay with with free practice too. My my only expectation was the fact that if you're hyping up the whole event to this extent, that this is probably the biggest spectacle of the whole world or an hour of F1 history. These are things that could have been sorted out uh, beforehand. That's that's my only thing. You know, frankly, I think you're right. Manhole covers have been a problem. We've seen this in China, in Baku, even in Monaco, which has been hosting a race for 70 odd years. That's there. I just have two things to just summarize this point because I really want us to talk about the racing, which was so fabulous. I would have loved to speak about manhole covers and <laughs> grandstand issues and all the entertainment if the racing was bad. But, you know, after the checkered flag fell on Sunday, I'm like, I'm willing to just forget all of that, at least on the Sunday and be like, oh my goodness, what a damn race that was. What a damn good race that was. But just to wrap up the manhole point, in my view, Formula One, especially the FIA, aren't doing street races for the first time. Yep. They've been doing it several times over. Clearly what came out and not has been confirmed by anybody, else, but maybe track uh, preparations were delayed given the mammoth event that Formula One, Liberty Media as promoters were trying to pull over. And I think, again, one of the motorsport journalists reported that the homologation actually took place at a very late time. And they were under pressure to just homologate the circuit. So the question is whether manhole covers tested or not, because this is the 1100th race of Formula One. We've had so many street races over the years, so many different promoters over the years hosting street races that they should have gotten this right for safety, for drivers, for fans, for everything point of view. And of course, on Friday or whenever Thursday, when this happened, Everyone was questioning. You're able to put in half a billion dollars into a pit building and all the entertainment and stuff like that. But hey, what does it cost to you know weld and secure all the manhole covers? Probably 1% or half a percent of that budget. Did you not do it? Did you forget to do it? Did you not do it right? And this also takes me back to, for example, the MotoGP in India. There was so much negative press and yeah. the general perception in the world was India can't pull out such an event. The truth is, that even a country like the USA, and like we've had Donald Trump say all along, make USA great again, maybe this is going to be his voting pitch the next time. Next time we have a Las Vegas Grand Prix, we'll make sure that the manhole covers are secure because we got to make America great again. Look at us, three grown men talking about manhole covers on a Sunday evening. If anyone walks into the recording studio and says, what are you guys doing? It's going to be a very tough conversation. But very quickly before we get to the racing, on the FIA, I know it's a, it seems like a rubbish penalty for Carlos Sainz, right? He's penalized for something that's totally out of his control. Literally, that causes him to, in a way, lose the race. Because had he qualified where he would have qualified, there's a very good chance he would have gone on to win it. But the thing is, the stewards can't do anything because they have to set an example. And things like petitions don't really work out in the sporting regulations of Formula 1. A local level championship, yes, you can have that wriggle room. Not really when the FI is involved and it's a world championship. And that's why... Even though everyone in the steward's office admits they can't do anything about it, it's a terrible penalty, they just have to give it. I'm just surprised that we can't have that wriggle room in that case and maybe let common sense do the talking. But I think let's also put the common sense to the talking in terms of racing. Because, folks, were you really entertained? I unfortunately missed out on watching the race in real time, so I can't tell 100%. But was it genuinely as entertaining as the hype made it up to be? The, the, the views were fantastic. The sphere was amazing. The lights were beautiful. The fake Eiffel Tower, in a way, made it even more special. And the fact that the cars were just revving out and topping out on the street, which is something I've never seen happen as much in a Formula 1 car, that, for me, gave me the entertainment, at least on the social media clips. But what was it like for you, folks? What about you, Kanal? Do you find it to be a very enjoyable race in a way at least the gaps made it seem like one it was enjoyable when was the last time that uh there was a competitor who finished so close to red bull especially in the rb19 yes you'll throw me back to brazil when lando norris was close enough etc uh but you know the fact is they still have a margin on this car to finish ahead and when we when you know the, the history will say max Verstappen won yet another race his 18th win of the season he's now equal with Sebastian Vettel with 53 wins, etc. We'll throw all these numbers. But again, he was made to work hard for the win. 
right from turn one, lap one, with that penalty, with all the chasing, with with uh, you know, with clearly not having the fastest car on the straights. So the the Ferrari was much quicker on the straights. He had to do a lot of chasing. He had to work hard for this win again. Pull off a lot of overtakes, which again on the medium tire when Red Bull was running, they were not as good with their tire degradation. So it wasn't an easy win for him. But, you know, all in all, my, my mind goes back to the fact that we had three drivers battling. We had several more within the field. The Alpines were battling. Lance Stroll made a recovery. Esteban Ocon made a recovery. It was also strategy involved because the second safety car came in at a great time. And, you know, Samuel and Sundaram, all, the, all through the weekend, everyone was talking about how cold it's going to be yeah. and how tough it's going to be for the tires, right? On via play, Mario Isola actually gave a brilliant insight, which wasn't really carried on a lot of networks. He said, we have tested in cold conditions before. We've had pre-season testing that's happened in Barcelona. We've seen snow, so we have tested. So we are not worried about cold conditions. But he said with the circuit characteristic, with these long straights, with these kind of corners, the biggest challenge teams will face is at the safety car restart. You will need to have a new tire, which is easy to put energy into compared to an old tire. Guess what happened? Second safety car, both the Red Bulls on the new tire, Charles Leclerc on a five-lap old hard tire, and we know how that race panned out. So that <laughs> insight from Isola now makes so much more sense. So I really hope that I'm pretty sure the teams knew all of this all along. I think what made it even more fun was the fact that we had that layer of unpredictability in the race. I mean, watching Leclerc's pace all the way through, and then when he got boxed, boxed in by the safety car, that I think was the game-changing moment. Eventually, you saw the pace, you saw everything that he was doing. And you thought, hey, maybe, just maybe, we could just see a second Ferrari win of the year and one each for Leclerc and Sainz. But I want to talk about the safety car, Sundaram. At that point, do you think it was the right or wrong thing for Leclerc to uh, not box? Because he just had new hard compound tyres that were five laps old. In that situation, I, I don't know. I don't think the process of deciding was wrong in any way whatsoever because if you've got five lap, uh, five lap new uh, hard compound tires and it's meant to be a long race afterwards I don't think it's technically wrong to box and compromise on track position it's just that Verstappen seemed to be so dominant but eventually I, I don't think I can fault Ferrari for that they just got locked in by a very mistimed safety car what do you reckon? Oh, absolutely. I think I, I, even I can't really fault them for the fact that they didn't pit during the second uh, safety car. That was just five laps after he pitted previously. Uh, I mean, generally, Leclerc looked quick throughout the whole weekend, uh, quick going quickest in the practice sessions, even throughout qualifying. And even today, even on, on, on the medium compounds, he was quicker than Verstappen. It's actually on the hard tires where Verstappen was able to light those tires up and, and go quicker than uh, Leclerc. But generally, if not for that safety car, Leclerc would have won this race for, for two main reasons. The fact is that the others really got that time advantage in the pits when the safety car is out. And, and this fact is that they got quicker tires, even if it was five laps younger they got quicker tires than Leclerc towards the end uh, but generally I, I, re I really can't fault them they were Leclerc went 20 laps on on the medium compound starting off so he was really inclined towards the one stopper but I think Ferrari really didn't want to take the risk of pitting again and then getting stuck within the grid uh, between cars so they went with the one stopper and I think it worked almost well it worked almost well for them I, I actually have a different view than Sundaram so Ferrari had a new set of hards available, but they chose track position over the Red Bull cars rather than, you know, I don't think it was a one stop or a two stop strategy. They knew that uh, their cards were sort of dealt the minute the Red Bulls pitted because the reverse could have also happened that Charles would have pitted and the Red Bulls would have stayed out and they would have lost track position. And then we've seen several times this year that track position has been more vital than anything mm. else in, given strategy or degradation or on track position and so on, right? So it was them choosing track position. And like you said, Sundaram, they had just five laps old tires. They actually had better tire degradation than Red Bull on the medium, yeah. which Charles very clearly attributed to uh, the cold temperatures. He's literally said post-race, I don't think our tire degradation is suddenly going to become better in the warmer clim uh, climates of Abu Dhabi. It was just the cold that made our tires 
uh, better. So it was just down to that. And then Charles actually said that he just couldn't bring in newer energies in his worn out tires, even though he was taking good care of his heart. So, you know, that, that was just down to what happened. But I'll be honest, I actually thought again towards the end of the race because of how Red Bull was chewing their tires. Uh, I thought that Charles' tires would again outlast the Red Bulls and he would probably make an attack, but that clearly wasn't to happen. But credit again to Pirelli because that hard tire was so good that it allowed for more flat out racing, uh, you know, uh, in, in Las Vegas. And if we just go back to Qatar, we were all discussing, let's mandate stint lengths because that yeah. will make drivers uh, push harder between stints. But imagine this, you have a really good tire, no mandated stint lengths, and the drivers were still able to push harder. So that sort of just made the difference. And, you know, uh, Sundaram and I were just digging through some data. In the top 10, if we were to just look at the strategies, there was just Charles Leclerc who didn't pit under the safety yeah. car. The, the safety car that was on the lap 25 or 26. Okay, in, sorry, in the top three, uh, there, there was also Ocon who didn't pit under the safety car who finished fourth great recovery and then it finally was oscar piastri who also didn't pit under that safety car so pitting under the safety car is typically what most people were doing in that top three or top 10 you know one of the other reasons why a lot of other drivers i mean if you look at the bottom half uh, people like Albon or Sargent didn't pit was the fact that they didn't have a spare set of, of hard tires. Mm. So it was really just the top, many of the top 10 finishers uh, finishing where they finished. And yet, I, we mentioned Ocon. We also have to touch upon, I think it's important to touch upon where Ocon and Stroll finished. Ocon started where 16th, Stroll started 19th. And they finished fourth yeah. and fifth in, in the standings. And it's all attributed to how well they started. Stroll started on softs and Ocon started on mediums. But they really made the most of that first lap, uh, the, the opening corner collision there. Or Alonso spinning around. <laughs> Not collision. <laughs> Alonso spinning around on his own. Uh, a rarity that. But they really did well uh, beyond after that. And a very interesting stat. I think this is my favorite stat of this weekend. This because we're also the Lance Stroll supporters club. All of a sudden, <laughs> this this is the first. And I know I've bashed bashed around the, the guy over the last couple of races, but the fact is, Lance Stroll has finished in the top five in consecutive races for the first time in his career. For the very first time in his career. You're kidding me, guys. Where's the applause? I've checked it twice. Don't 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 put me in a doubt. Uh, don't put me in doubt. But I'm going to check it once again. But I'm pretty sure this is the first time he's he's finished in the top My five in back to back races. So credit where it's due. Credit where it's due. He's been doing extremely well. He's had a bit, bit of a barren run. Uh, bit since of the a barren run. Break. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Guys, one sec, one sec, one sec. Where is the applause? Where is the applause? Come on, we can't be that bad. We we, we have got to be good human beings, right? Come on. He deserves it. He deserves it. No. So you could look at it that way and be like, he's on the best run of form in his life. No, but in all in all seriousness, uh, genuinely, genuinely great to see Lance Stroll do what he's actually capable of doing. Just that sometimes the form dips out very, very badly. And you need this stuff. For once, it's actually Lance Stroll doing well and not Fernando Alonso. And that is, in a way, heartening to see. If only that team can have two competitive drivers, it'll be amazing for next year. But that stat by Sundara was indeed a bombshell. And just like Jeremy Clarkson says, and on that bombshell, we should take a short break. But we'll be back in a second. Here's a quick message. Welcome back, folks, to the Inside Line F1 podcast and our Las Vegas GP review. Now, we've spoken about Max. We've spoken about how good he was. Actually, we haven't touched up on that. Let's just say it's a classic Max Verstappen performance. Even though he had damage, even though he had a five-second penalty, class apart, as always, I think let's talk about Max for a second, right? I, I want to talk about that penalty in a way. Uh, now, here at the JKTI National Racing Championship in India, it's been discussed quite a lot by the stewards. Was it a fair penalty or not? It's kind of funny, isn't it, Kunal, when you come to think about it, that the five-second penalty, in a way, is a gift for Max. Because after that, oh, even though he admitted full blame for it, fair enough, fair play to Max for that one. In a way, because he got to stay ahead of Leclerc, a, it helped out with his tyres. He wasn't able to be in dirty air, which is great for your tyre wear as it goes on. And B, clean air to max. That's like giving, I don't know, uh, That that's like, name a good warrior. Uh, that's like giving, no, Julius Caesar wasn't a warrior. 
Okay, that's like giving I, Brock Lesnar a fight against a lightweight athlete. He'll just crush him <laughs> completely. And that's what Max did with the clean air eventually. Especially in that Red Bull, right? Which is so good on its tires. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah, the FI should necessitate a swap in such situations because track position, like we sp- spoke before, is crucial. Running in clean air is even more crucial. And uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, Max, I like the way he explained it. He said, you know, actually, I didn't, I, ju- I was just slipping on four tires. I didn't intend to run him out, but I just <laughs> ran out of grip. And then he said, we actually, both of us, you know, break late. Fair enough. He admitted his his fault, which is always a good thing, which is not always a Max Verstappen thing, especially in, you know, wheel-to-wheel combat. But uh, Max was actually out, you know, in a very lion-hearted way to get to anybody and everybody who got in his way. It was Esteban Ocon in qualifying. Then some dude named Steve Hill from Las Vegas Grand Prix who was trying to, you know, shoot down Max's comments against Las Vegas. And then when the Thursday fiasco happened, Max literally said something like suits him. So, you know, it was like kind of way of getting back to to Steve for what he said. But, (laughs) um, you know, all in all, that Red Bull was epic. And the circuit configuration was so good that usually we get the, you know, straights, slow speed, medium speed, high speed. These are the four variables on which you, you know, compare cars and packages. Las Vegas was slow speed, straights. Literally, just two variables that you compared. And yeah. Red Bull was consistently second fastest across both of them. Okay. And that's why the Red Bull was just so good on uh, on this. And somehow I also love these low downforce, low grip, icy uh, circuits because you could see on the onboards, the drivers were constantly, you know, fighting the car. They had those steering movements that they were doing all along, which which sort of helped. I'm sure the track temperatures it being colder helped as well. There was a lot of track evolution, which you know we saw in qualifying, we saw during the race as well, and maybe we should touch upon qualifying a little later on in the show as well. But all in all, Max Verstappen, another um, you know another super win that I, I think he he dominated in a, in a way that we've seen him dominate all season long and. Uh, I, I only thing is, you know, maybe he can just let people be like Ocon or Steve Hill or, or whoever <laughs> and just fine. Let let somebody have their way on him. It's like my way or no way with Max Verstappen. Not that I'm saying is right or wrong. I'm just making a comment. He, he wouldn't be Max if that was the case, no, Kunal? He wouldn't be the kind of driver or the person he is if he just let them go in a way. But I find it then he'll funny. be then he'll be neutral or medium or average with Stappen, right? He's oh, max in all his emotions or whatever. Daddy joke. Oh God! I should have given a daddy joke alert, but <laughs> you 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 finally got into my level of jokes now. I love it. I've, have I had that much of an influence on you? <laughs> you see, well, I should ask my daughter if my jokes have become better. She's the only uh, pure metric for this. <laughs> <laughs> but now that we're talking about influence in a way, uh, it's interesting how the Verstappen influence kind of came to Sergio Perez in this race. I, I liked what he did in a, in a way. His pace was good. We were genuinely interested to see if he could potentially get pole. Now, that didn't work out according to plan. But in the middle of the race, there was looking like a time where he could have at least gotten Leclerc, but eventually that got faded out as well. Fair to say that it was the best that he could have got Sundaram? At least looking at the data, at least looking at the lap times and hearing his side of this race, it seemed like the best he could have done. But in a way, it's still much, much better than what he's seen so far. And we slandered uh, slandered him a lot for his terrible performances. I think it's fair to comment that he is much better now than he was a few races ago. And that's quite heartening to see in a way. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the sort of form that he had in Qatar, especially, um, you kind of see a driver going down that, that downward spiral. And we just hope that it stops at some point and, and the driver gets a little bit of momentum, a little bit of confidence. And that kind of worked in, 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 in Brazil the last time out. I felt him battling with Alonso throughout the latter stages of the race and still coming out just a little bit behind him, I felt this is probably a step in the right direction for Perez that, okay, he, probably you're going to see a couple of good performances from him. And thankfully, we saw that today. It didn't start off well. I mean, he didn't have the best of qualifyings and he didn't have the best of, of the opening laps as well. He had to pit. Uh, he was caught up with the whole Alonso Bottas uh, thing over there. Uh, but what he made out of the race after that, sure, the safety car also kind of was helpful in that sense. But what he made of the race thereafter was very, very impressive. And 
the moment Perez actually passed Leclerc, I was like, okay, probably Perez is going to win another race. I, I kind of started imagining or visualizing all those sort of stats that go into uh, Perez winning a street race, but then Leclerc uh, brought it back. Uh, but I think this kind of uh, silences all the rumors, at least for a little bit, in 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 Perez, uh, Perez's part. Um, he's he's done well in the last two races, and let's hope that that continues for him in in the future. You so know, one, one of the uh, go go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, Perez actually, I like how, you know, all, all he needs is one or two really good weekends and suddenly everybody is happy to back him, including himself. And it's all in the mind, which is great for him. Congratulations, Mr. Checo Perez on P2 and all our Mexican listeners who we know there are tons of them out there. Uh, but the, the, the main thing is, you know, again, an insight on why Checo Perez couldn't keep the lead, even though he had the lead of the race, right? What, what Sundaram just said is Checo was actually in a higher wing configuration than Max Verstappen mm. and he accepted that he was actually losing out on straight line speed advantage compared to Charles Leclerc and then of course to uh, Max Verstappen as well which is why when Charles was able to make that dive in and just you know make the overtake it was just down to ex- you know the extra speed advantage that Charles had on that back straight so all in all great recovery I mean not the best of Saturdays for Checo but we've seen that you know Everybody calls him a Sunday driver, which, you know, suddenly could also work against him next year if, the, you know, if somebody else comes in uh, battling the Red Bull, uh, you know, Red Bull racing clan. And that high, high wing setup in a way, I don't think he means that had he gone for the low setup, he would have won. Because some racing drivers, the reason why they do that is just to cover up for their deficiencies. Sometimes you need more confidence heading into the corners, which is probably the reason why Sergio might have gone for a setup quite like that. And maybe if they had not gone for that same setup, he just wouldn't have been up there in the first place. So who knows? It's a it's a little bit of a topsy-turvy thing in a way. But let's now very, very quickly talk about the other things. McLaren very, very quickly, guys. I don't think their weekend was as bad as it looked like. Because after Oscar Piastri and Landon Norris came out to the media uh, on Sunday... Uh, wait, not Sunday. Saturday night, in a way? No, okay, let's call it Sunday because in the time zones it was Sunday. But in a way, uh, the fun fact is they said that the only reason why their weekend was bad, guys, was because they went out on Q1 on only one set of tyres. The track evolved way too quickly. And even though in practice they had good pace for Q3 and also the race pace looked like they would be somewhere in the upper top 10, they eventually ended up just getting knocked out of Q1. And once that happens, we just saw the amount of chaos that you get involved in. Piastri is still ending up with a decent auto result, result in a way, even though he had that clash. But Lando Norris getting involved in a clash in a kerfuffle of sorts in the first couple of laps. And there we are at the end, McLaren ending up with one of their worst weekends of the year. It sort of is a little artificial, but I, I feel that these sort of weekends are where McLaren really should be performing higher. And it feels a little bit of a dagger to the heart as a McLaren fan, where we see stuff like this happening and they're not able to close up to Ferrari as quickly as they could have done, Sundaram. Oh, that that's true. And and the thing is that them not having a good race weekend kind of brings Aston Martin back into content, uh, contention because they are just 11 points ahead of Aston Martin going into Abu Dhabi. McLaren scored just two points this time out. Aston Martin scored, how much was it? 12 points. They scored 12 points today. And that kind of takes things... I mean, I mean Ferrari and Mercedes are just four points uh, away from each other. Uh, but yeah, McLaren, I think they did have a decent pace and they would have finished, uh, like you said, in the upper top 10. Piastri could have... I mean, I think Piastri did extremely well um, for how, however long he did before the incident with uh, Hamilton. But he was making moves. He looked strong. He finished 10th. He finished 9th eventually. But surely he could have been up there 5th, 6th. An unlucky weekend for them, all in all. Not the best, but probably the whole circuit configuration probably uh, not working in their favor. But things could probably be better in Abu Dhabi. And, and you know, I'm going to explain the McLaren situation a little more because, yes, it's down to bad luck, bad results, all of that. But this also highlights the challenges that drivers are now facing in qualifying because clearly, you know, the Las Vegas Grand Prix qualifying was a different challenge. Usually you want to keep your tires alive. So you drive really slow so you don't burn out your tires on the opening lap itself or the out lap mm. as we call it, right? In Las Vegas, it was the opposite. You needed to do two or three 
high speed runs for you to get your lap in. So suddenly you were fueled up higher and you were just going round and round and round and your second and third and you know fourth lap sometimes was giving you the key lap time you needed in qualifying. But there were two more complexities. You have the maximum delta time you got to follow. You cannot open up a gap even in the, the pit lane now with all those weird FI rules that have come in. <laughs> so what happened is a lot of, even Checo Perez, you know, he was out of the car instead of being out on track, trying to make a, uh, you know, trying to make, have another go at the lap times, right? So run plans for a lot of teams were compromised because you were suddenly needing to not just plan for your rivals doing one push lap, you were they were all doing two or three push laps. So how do you plan for such a run plan? And I think McLaren were just caught out with that. And then, like you said, Sommel, track evolution was big. But I love this about Formula One. Different tracks, different temperatures, different compounds, all of them offering different challenges each race weekend. The narratives keep changing. The variables keep changing, right? And at the end, very glad that Lando Norris was, you know, fine and safe. That that seemed like a relatively simple crash, but he had to go to the Circuit Medical Inspection Center, and then he was admitted to the University Medical Center, which is basically the hospital that I believe was affiliated or joint with the Las Vegas Grand Prix for precautionary checks. And it was only, you know, a couple of hours after the crash that he was released after those precautionary checks as well. But this means that Aston Martin, which we all thought, we all wrote off after some point, are now, how many points? I think eight points away from McLaren, which is fantastic. McLaren's two points. Is it 11 points? Yes, 11 points. Sorry. Yes. My math is always bad between eight and 11. So anyway, and McLaren's two points are is their lowest score from a race weekend in which they have scored points. And mind you, they haven't scored points in five race weekends this season. And, you know, I think if Aston Martin pipped them, okay, and maybe Fernando Alonso is kicking himself for that overzealous move into turn one, where suddenly he was, he was more Mazispin style than Fernando Alonso style, I would say. But uh, to just finish fourth would give Aston Martin so much of a psychological advantage into everything that they've tried to do this year. And mind you, they've made a significant step from last year to this year. Now then, folks, after all of McLaren, we very, very quickly need to talk about two things before we come to the end of the show. Firstly, a word on Esteban Ocon. Brilliant, brilliant driving, great recovery. But we have spoken about that in a little bit of depth. Uh, I want to talk about Lewis Hamilton for a second, guys, uh, because we know him as the ultimate showbiz professional of Formula One. He's always the flashy one, always with the bling, always with the fancy outfits, always starting up with the headlines. I think this was the most, uh, what can I say? Uh, What's the right word I'm looking for? I think the most Lewis Hamilton weekend, but in a negative way, where he still, I mean, he had just all the chaos in the world, right? Dropped back down after the opening lap had contact with everyone, made contact with Piastri as well, eventually fell back in. And still, after all all the chaos and drama that he went through, he A, ended up beating George Russell and B, ended up finishing P7 in the race. It's like you expect the best of the very best from Lewis Hamilton, which he also showed, but there's also the parallel side to it. I don't think bittersweet is enough to sum it up. It's like walking into a casino and ending up with the same amount of money that you walked into and not winning anything extra. It's still fine. You're not losing money, but it's not really extra special, if that is a Las Vegas reference to use in a way. I I kind of found Lewis Hamilton's weekend to be super fun. And with all that chaos as well, Russell just wasn't able to keep up, which I found to be very interesting. But do we want to talk about the off-track stuff, folks? Do we want to talk about the lawsuits and the oil spill? I think that, Sundaram, is the craziest part of it all, right? Where Lewis Hamilton, if I talk about his crazy weekend, Lewis Hamilton's parade car, ended up having an oil spill at the outset of turn one, which apparently was the reason why Max Verstappen lost grip. Crazy in a way. It is. And I mean, everything just turned up for, for the Las, Las Vegas Grand Prix, all the sort of controversies. This is the first of 10 races that we're going to be having in Las Vegas. They have a 10-year contract. And you really want your first race weekend to go off well. You really don't want to have, to, you really don't want to have these sort of issues uh, happening. And everything kind of just came in at the same time. And I'm sure people are going to be talking about it. Um, but yeah, things worked out for... I mean, things didn't work out for Lewis Hamilton. He, 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 sta- he, he started off on the hard tires. He finished the 17 laps on those. And... 
everyone else did easily 20 25 laps on those hard tires so him actually tagging with Oscar Piastri meant he had to cut short his overall stint and uh, he just did another 9 laps on the medium so it didn't really work out for him uh yeah <laughs> i really don't know what to say beyond this <laughs> you're a lot like rohit sharma in a way <laughs> when asked about such a tendulkar statue really? i really am <laughs> yes absolutely now it's a statue what do i have to say about that i love i love that guy hopefully he brings us the world cup by by the time this episode comes to an end but on to other matters uh, kunal i want to know your thought on uh, your thoughts on the entire weekend as a whole generally because looking at all the videos that the fans have put in looking at uh, all the articles that the journalists have written and all the footage that we get to see on the internet it seems like they've made it happen Yes, there are teething issues. Surely, manhole covers are fixable. Let's put it that way. Uh, things like and they were fixed very well. Yeah. I must say, yeah, they were just not fixed on time or in time for Thursday. They were fixed in time or fixed maybe six hours too late. But that's okay. I mean, I think we should just move on from manhole covers. <laughs> we were not going to mention manhole yeah. covers ever again. Yeah, but I can tell you the class so class loss class whatever class action lawsuit two hundred dollars that everyone got. fans being asked to go home security was overworked etc i'm sure the organizers did their thing trying to do best for what was for formula 1 at no point you know does formula 1 have to turn around and say no let's send the fans back especially when fans are paying the highest to be at this race i'm pretty sure they had their reasons let's remember the races also happen at really odd hours the track sessions happen like 4am you know. or something i mean imagine this if it was a music concert at 4am there's a good chance you would have been told sorry but please go home and we'll give you a youtube link to go watch the the the, the music's uh, you know music uh, uh you know performance on but all in all i think again a very packed race when it comes to celebrities i saw the start grid helicopter shot and i said how are they going to clear this before the 5 minute exactly. mark um david beckham went from the cricket world cup in mumbai to the las vegas grand prix in las vegas obviously paris hilton was there she said lando norris was her favorite driver Right now, I sound like a news reader just reading out who all was there. Shaquille <laughs> O'Neal was there, but I—I I mean, you know, his answers were very, very robotic. I actually thought he will drive the, the whatever the cavalcade or be a part of that. But what did you guys think of the new podium ceremony? Because they drove through the Bellagio, they had the fountains thing. It was, you know, Max's podcast on the way there. <laughs> Reminded me of Ocean's Eleven. David Coulthard did an interview with just one mic, so he was handing over his mic to the driver. Somebody forgot the driver's mic out there, <laughs> and then they came back on a Checo Perez podcast, which was so boring that they didn't broadcast more than thirty seconds of it. I I was a little surprised to be honest because I know Formula One in general is is very picky or or a little uh, concerned about their broadcast times and. that is actually one of the things that i thought happens in spa usually after the race ends in spa you don't have drivers doing the yeah. whole lap because yeah. the whole lap is that long so they kind of go the other way around in in the pit lane just to save on time uh, br- save on broadcast time that didn't seem to be a concern this time out everyone is going uh, all the way to some other part of the whole track for the post race <laughs> interviews and then they came back that was what was really very surprising for me because then they had those platforms set out uh, on on the circuit and drivers were walking up to their podium positions there they really had a lot of time on the broadcast post race which is very surprising for me not a fan of it to be very honest i just want to get over the podium and get on with other things in life but yeah i think it was a bit too lengthy for my life i'm just glad <laughs> they didn't have a random american interviewer for the podium questions because that is blasphemy for me But anyway, I think one second, one second. Danica Patrick should be also counted as a random podium interviewer. Genuinely, I think yeah, let's put her on that little, list. I'm a little mixed, you know. Sometimes she asks, you know. I think when she puts her race car driver hat on, she asks really good questions. When she takes that hat off, I don't know what hat she puts on because then the questions are really random. But I'm assuming it's just one and zero race car or not a race car driver. But but it's uh, is it fair to say she's just there for the accent in a way because it feels like that because sometimes there are better interviews. David Coulthard is very good. Why why bother changing? Yeah, I agree. He's a wire play expert. We have him every race, which is fantastic. Best insights. 
I'm glad we don't have a certain Scottish driver who I've worked with in the past doing interviews anymore. <laughs> Won't name people, but that's a hint enough. But uh, P1, P2, P3 all confirmed in the Drivers' Championship. P4 is a four-way battle which will be settled in Abu Dhabi. I think it's Sainz, Alonso, Norris, Leclerc. That actually reminds me, opening lap spins were the two Spaniards in spinning in succession. You know, like, oh, Alonso's fun. Maybe I need to spin the car. And Carlos went behind him as well. But uh, no, all in all, you know, uh, the, the the race in itself was uh, was pretty memorable, if that's, that's the word I would say. And the biggest, the best memory is going to be for Jacques Villeneuve. What? The former world champion who yeah, got Villeneuve. married in the... Yeah, the former world champion, 1997 world champion, got married in the paddock. In the chapel in the paddock, I should say that, what? right? In the race to the altar. Yeah, it's public news. And I know you were, you know, commentating for the uh, for the Indian Racing League and the JKTR National Racing Championship. But Shaks will now got married. Now, <laughs> if, if I was to ever get married again... <laughs> With Mithila, I would definitely go there and say, you know what, Las Vegas Chapel, here we come. Why not? It's it's a very Jacques Villeneuve thing to do as well, right? Retire from Formula One, start a music career, quit a team randomly, go to the Indy 500 after winning the F1 World Championship, and maybe just get married at the Las Vegas altar. If there was one person in the world who could have and should have done it, it was Jacques Villeneuve. But folks, uh, any any final comment from you, Sundaram? Because I feel that. Even though Max has come out for a two and a half minute tirade in the press conference, criticizing everything that the Las Vegas GP stands for, I think it's a little hollow because there are two sorts of fans in the world. There is There are people like us who watch every single session constantly, track all the data, all the timings, look at the stats and all of your wonderful stats as well, and are really hardcore into what makes the sport so special. But let's not forget, half the money comes from the people on the other side, the casual people, the people who think Leclerc are cute and only watch it for that. And I, I, I mean, it could be fair to say that a lot of the Las Vegas audience was generally a lot from that audience. But why do we discriminate? Why do we not create a product for them as well? I think what Formula One is doing with the Las Vegas GP and Miami and many other circuits is only fair. It is meant to be a profit-making enterprise, right? It's not meant to be a boon for the sport. Formula One is a business at the end of the day. It's not meant to be uh, kind of like a religious pilgrimage of sorts for racing lovers. It's it's essentially there to have a profit on the business for Liberty Media. And that's what it stands for. And that'll, that'll always be the case in any business or any sport. The fact being that there's always two different types of fans. Sure, we call us purists or whatever it is, there will always be fans who don't watch every single session. And what they created, I think, with, with Las Vegas, I think even more than the Miami Grand Prix, if there are any casual fans who tuned into the race, just the race and probably not even any of the practice sessions, I think they were treated to a very good race. They were also treated to a very good qualifying in that sense. And Sure, they're probably going to uh, turn up for the race next year because of how well this this event turned out. The main the main event is what I'm talking about. And I think that's also good in that sense. Formula One, we kind of know why Formula One went to Las Vegas. We know why Formula One chose that particular section, why why why, why they chose this venue as, as, as the circuit. And sure, there are, apart from on-track, uh, I mean, advantages, there are other things uh, that help in the background the lot of business opportunities that arise from this locally and for formula one so in that sense i think they'll go away feeling happy yeah and i have to ask a question mm-hmm. I, you know Toto wolf said who in europe watches these sessions anyway okay the spotify poll this this for this episode is going to be if you're anywhere in the world and you watch free practice sessions Please answer and tell us what all sessions you actually watch. <laughs> Take off all the sessions you watch because I know a lot of people who watch pretty much all the sessions out there. But an interesting point about, you know, this whole business. Now, F1 teams have become these franchisees being valued at a billion or a couple of billion dollars. You know, you can throw any number and you'll just say it's a valuation, right? <laughs> Here's here, here's my so, small take, and I know now we've you know definitely breached the forty minute mark, which is what our you know review episodes are uh, typically as long. But hey, it's Las Vegas and it's a Sunday, so I'm hoping that people are still. I know people will still have been tuned in, so thank you very much for your time. But you know, with this with with Formula One teams becoming positive business entities, making a profit, your survival in the sport, your survival instinct for the sport 
changes. Hmm. Five years ago, when the businesses needed to perform on track they, to survive, they were as hungry as ever to perform on track to survive. I'm not saying the hunger has gone down in any way, but now they know whether they finish second or third in a race or in the championship or whatever, the business is still making pot loads of money, right? And that was, that was, I think, that the Toto Wolf, the businessman in Formula One who spoke on that Thursday or that Friday, actually, because the team principal speak a day after the drivers, right? And not the team principal of a Formula One team. No, I find it, find it interesting how things have all gone about all the way through. But yeah, Sundaram, you had a really fun point, right? On this entire weekend and anything that really pops out of your mind? Well, I'm just looking forward to one more thing right now. I want to see if Ferrari is going to take uh, the last week as Grand Prix promoters to court because that's what Haas did in 2017. Um, when they had a manhole, I know, I know, we've spoken enough Man about manhole covers, covers. <laughs> but that's. <laughs> I know we've spoken enough of that, but actually, Haas took the the circuit to court in 2017 over uh, the the drain cover coming loose and and giving sort of damage that Roman Grosjean's car had. Who won? And that whole thing took Wait, a who won? That took that whole thing took took a year to settle, and they did pay uh, pay the team out of their insurance money. The circuit did pay. I'm not, and I'm not sure if they did that in twenty. If Williams did that in 2019, when was that? 2019, 2019 Baku yeah. was yeah. it 19 or 20? 2019. I remember Claire Williams saying that we will take this up with with the circuit. No news after that. And I know Fred Vasser was livid in in the press conference. He was absolutely uh, frustrated, annoyed at, at what happened. I'm re- and it also really matters because it's the budget gap. Sure, it won't kind of help them in the sense that it reduces uh, the money that the circuit may give. It reduces that from the budget cap. It's still going to be put on there. But I just want to see Ferrari takes uh, the Las Vegas organizers to court to kind of recoup that money. Yeah, you you mean if Ferrari will take Liberty Media to court to just say you're paying us so oh, much yes. money, you play us a little more for the damage of the car. But hey, that's what Liberty Media gets for taking on the you know for being a promoter in Formula One, I guess. <laughs> but at the end of the day, all is well that ends well. And yes, it might have just been a Verstappen win at the end of the day. That's what the results will say. A far greater story than that. But eventually, good to see. Finally, the hype being settled. Finally, we have a race at Las Vegas now. And it's no longer just a dream that we've had in the past as well. But folks, thank you so much for listening into this episode and hearing us banter about manhole covers, among many other things. And in case you enjoyed this episode, please, please, please support us by subscribing to the Inside Line F1 podcast and also by sharing this episode to all your friends and family members who might enjoy this as well. Folks, we'll be back very quickly for the... What's next? Abu Dhabi only? Is that it? Yeah, I think it is Abu Dhabi only. So we'll be back for the Abu Dhabi GP preview very, very shortly. But stay tuned to the Inside Line F1 podcast, folks. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. Before we ended, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Amazon Music once again for partnering with us on this episode of the podcast.